and welcome to the Capital Conversation with me, Michael Heyman. Now, my guest today is the retail and innovation trends expert, James Bidwell, a man who started his career working at Disney. He's built his own magic kingdom as owner and chair of Springwise, the world's largest idea spotting network. Described from his time in retail as Selfridge's very own ringmaster extraordinaire, he's now helping businesses to deal with disruption. To tell us more, welcome to the show, James Bidwell. James, great to have you on the show. Great to be here, Michael. Thanks for inviting me. The kind of I'm, I'm sure going to get to the sort of uh, the sort of ringmaster extraordinaire at Selfridges, but that's a that's a great title to uh, to intro you with. I it think. was a great it was a great thing. It was I think a journalist picked it up and, and wrote it in an article, and it was really about that time in Selfridges when we were transforming everything. And my job was kind of to be the master and the c conductor of the orchestra, and we ran some amazing marketing programs and kind of brought in new brands and really changed a, a, a down and sort of dowdy department store into one of the most uh, exciting shopping desks. Really? Well, we'll France, come back so. to your role as the, as the kind of yep. Mr. Selfridges <laughs> of the 21st century. But before we do, let's talk about today's role, looking at trends, how you spot them, what you do with them. Something I noticed on, on your website was a Microsoft stat, which, um, which makes the case that 50% of business leaders believe that their own business models have less than five years to run. <laughs> Are they all living on borrowed time? Well, um, one would think uh, that many of them are um, if, we, if we look around today. I think what the, the point of that is that the pace of change has exponentially grown. And um, what we're dealing with now is a, is a very uncertain times. Um, we're dealing with uh, rapid, rapid growth, rapid, rapid change across the world. We're, of course, dealing with a tech-enabled uh, world in which um, the ability to predict becomes increasingly mm. difficult. But, but, I mean, is that... Are they believing that they're just going to be gone in five years? I mean, right. is that is that is that the, are they that? scared of the future? I think that, you know, some of them are very scared, but I think what they're saying really is that we need to change our business models. We need to move. We need our organizations to change at a much rap more rapid pace um, than we ever have before. So, so the call to arms, if you like, from the modern CEO is like, we need an agile we culture. We need an agile wo workforce. We need flexibility in order to deal with uh, what is going to be coming. And of course, if you're a legacy organization, one that has been relying on a business model that, are, that has been going for maybe three or four decades, and suddenly you're in this uh, this moment of, of change and, and kind of inflection point, then you need to have your mm. organisation. I mean, and here we are. It takes the telephone 75 years to reach 50 million users, Facebook one year and Pokemon Go 19 days. Yeah. I mean, I suppose the question is, well, how quickly will it be on the next big sort of move? And, and what does that mean for, for the rest of us in terms of that speed of change? So I think, you know, almost um, we have instant communication, of course, and, and we have stories that go globally um, immediately. So, so I think we're in that, we're in that time. Um, the question is, how do we deal with it? How do we move uh, in a way that is sensible and um, uh, that, that our organizations can cope with? So what we spend a lot of time doing is, is understanding where we want to go and then go at the right mm. pace. So, I mean, we've yeah. all heard the say, I feel the need, the need for speed. Well, it's here. I mean, the speed is here. I mean, but are we, are we belted in and, and controlled? that or are we actually prisoners of, of that change? I think a bit of both. So all of these, uh, there's always two sides to the same coin. But I think we are, we are in some ways um, taking great advantage of that. And you can see businesses that are just jumping on that and saying, you know, this is fantastic. I'm going to really grow with it and so roll with it. So what's an example? Well, I think of the, that. Whole, the whole, you know, the whole, the business, businesses like in the new economy, so the WeWorks, the the Alibabas, the kind of um, Airbnbs, who are seeing an opportunity uh, to reinvent a business right. model and then jumping on top of that. So if you're born digital, it's great. What happens if you're not born digital? Well, if you're not born digital, you need to be transforming fast and you need to be changing fast. So mm. um, I think uh, the the companies. So that we are seeing companies that are doing that really successfully, and um, and you need to be you know thinking about an agile uh, point of view and an agile way of behaving. Mm. You said that after 25 years of sitting and looking at brands, I can see that the businesses that don't have purpose will fail. I mean, this sort of mo moving this on now to what businesses stand for, businesses as a force for 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 good, for change. I mean, is is that another part of the future that that you see? I see it as mission critical. So it's one of my great passions. We've just become a B Corporation. You, you know a lot about that. So we've been so just explain uh, yeah, B we've Corp. Enshrined, um, environmental um, positive environmental action positive social action as well as um, a mission to make money mm -hmm. in our in our kind of shareholders agreement at reset um, and, and at Springwise. Uh, uh, and B Corp is a group of like-minded businesses that, that, that buy into that 
ethical uh, business model. Absolutely. So it's more, um, it's more actually a movement. So it's a movement of organizations where they have understood that um, more purposeful brands, more purposeful businesses will not only attract more customers and therefore be more successful, but also will attract more employees uh, and mm. the right kind of people to go on that journey with them. And, and absolutely, business has to be a force for change. And I do believe that uh, it's possible. So, so why don't more do it? Why, why, why are you still the exception rather than the rule? Well, I think that there is increasing evidence that more are doing it. I mean, you look at uh, Unilever under Paul Polman, you know, there was a big transformation. He didn't quite get to making it a B corporation, but he had B corporations in the, in the portfolio. Uh, we need more leaders to decide and more investors uh, to decide that um, the planet is more important than profit. Um, and that is a big, is a big issue for people But some people, people would say to. that the way you get more responsible businesses is to charge them more tax. Well, there is, a, there is that, and then there's also others who say, well, let's make lots of money and then become philanthropists. But actually, it's the process of making money and being purposeful, which I believe will um, be, the, be the alchemy in the future. Mm. I mean, do you, do you think that's going to be where the next big sort of super brand comes from, from this kind of tradition from this kind of approach? So I think the next sort of big revolution will be the green economy. And I think that businesses and brands that come out of that will uh, be the winners in the future. So you look at something like Patagonia, the, the brand from uh, West Coast America, where they have actually ingrained in, clothing their, brand. The, in the, clo yeah. the clothing brand as opposed to a place to go on holiday yeah, or go climbing, which is also nice. Um, they have, <laughs> um, for, for, for many, many years, had that enshrined in their DNA. And they've kind of taken those business decisions uh, based on the, the doing good for the planet. Um, what is uh, interesting about that, they're still private, so they haven't gone to the markets and said, uh, you know, they want to IPO or something like that, probably because the investors mm. would say, well, I mean, you very, know, very, we, very, we, you know, uh, to, to that make. point, they very famously had a campaign called Don't Buy This Jacket, you know, the jackets that you don't need to buy, because they, they then sold quite a lot of them. I mean, is that just a, the more cynical edge of of business I, I, using I good to, to I don't sell think more. so. I think there is a lot of cynicism and there are a lot of cynical businesses, but um, I think Patagonia is a business that really does care about it. Okay. And, uh, yeah, so, you can, yeah. No, well, let's move on to, to <laughs> just, just think about lots to cover. But I mean, you know, one of the things that um, Springwise, your business, was an early spotter of in trends was it predicted success for Facebook and, and Snapchat um, quite early on before they were the household names they are today. What, what, what made them stand out um, as businesses? So what we do is we, we have a, just to explain quickly, we have 20,000 people around the world who are spring spotters who are looking for innovations for us every day. And we publish the top three that we see. So we get about 100 ideas coming through. And what we're looking for is we're looking for the outliers. We're looking for what academics are doing, what startups are doing, the things that aren't kind of necessarily obvious. So um, actually, Facebook was spotted. And, and it wasn't spotted as Facebook. It was spotted as a, a student activity in a dorm room. And it was this kind of begin, right at the beginning before it was even called Facebook. Um, and Snapchat, we spotted um, went, you know, right at the beginning of its journey. So what we're looking to do is we're looking for new business models. We're looking for things that are different, things where we see there mm. is kind of potential change. Well, so, to, that, to that point, early backer of Bitcoin. Absolutely. Yeah, well, we, were a we weren't a backer. We were a, a discoverer of. So right. we're, we're, an, we're an editorial and, platform rather it, than an investor. But is that all more, more fizzle than sizzle? I mean, you know, we went up and... People sort of were making quite a lot of money, and then they suddenly yeah, I mean, it's going, it's going up and down. So we're not we're not in the business. So a lot of investors will look at Springwise and then look at, invo in, at Springwise to in, in, to inform their investment decisions. But we're not taking any responsibility for that. Um, I think something like Bitcoin, we're looking at the, the <laughs> model. We're looking at what's going on here. How does blockchain work? Mm. You know, do we think blockchain is going to be something that's important? And the answer is yes. How it will manifest itself and what is that process for it to become something that's economically successful is a completely different okay. uh, a different conversation. So, so new business model coming out of the digital economy, when, when we see lots of people talking about the dangers of digital, when we look at the health warnings that people are attaching yeah. to social media, many people in government calling for the same sorts of things that you might see on packets of, of cigarettes yep. in terms of the uses of things like Facebook and other social media outlets. What's, what's the trend we should spot there? What should business think about in terms of that kind of environment? So I think business needs to be pretty careful about the uh, the kind of the dominance of the large social media and and tech companies. I think we're seeing the backlash already beginning. Um, there's no doubt that these companies have grown faster than the regulators. Will it get worse, that, that, that backlash? I th well, I think that it'll come to a tipping point. There will be some sort of uh, moment uh, where it has to, you know, there has to be some sort of change. But the difficulty is, and it's back to this pace of change, is that the, the, the regulators are not able to move fast enough to deal with um, a lot of the, the, the pace of change in the, in, the, mm. in the kind of tech economy and the broader economy. So is that when you look at the trends then, will 
will the major trend be about how we manage that pace of change in terms of innovations and things that might come next? So Maybe I, I should join, so join your team. I don't <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, fantastic. No, I think, you know, I think there is a, a major change, a major kind of theme, which is how do we deal with that? How do we kind of incorporate it into our worlds? How do we look after our children who are being, you know, kind of uh, spending all this time on their screens and all of that? And, you know, you look at the, 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 the recent results, it's only just catching up that there may be a link between social media with um, mental health uh, issues amongst children, but that you know it's been pretty clear. But the the science is just catching up with the surveys and all of that. So how do you how do we deal with that? So society as a whole has a a balancing act because these these um, these devices are incredibly useful from a productivity point of view. Um, but there are some massive changes. You look at the Indian election, which is coming up, and there's all sorts of commentary around that at the moment as to how digital media is being manipulated for um, the, the the political side of things. So which I don't want to go into in detail because we've run out of time. <laughs> Speed has, speed has had us, the Indian elections, it could have been. But we'll be right back, and when we do, we're going to ask James whether London's innovation scene is in full bloom or entering its very own winter of discontent. We'll be back in a moment. Welcome back. My guest today is the chair of Springwise, James Bidwell. James. Um, we spoke a lot about the big trends, but let's talk about your big career because um, it's taken you from Disney to Selfridges to visit London. Um, who's to blame? What's the thread? <laughs> so, so I think the, the thread is um, moments of change, um, inflection points. So when I was at Disney, I was uh, part of the launch team of Disneyland Paris a long time ago, 25 years ago. Um, so I was out there before, mm. it was, before it was built, working in a really interesting environment with a kind of American-European kind of mix of people, building one of the biggest um, tourist developments in, in Europe has ever seen. And then, then Selfridges was the big turnaround. So um, I was part of that, that group that turned it around. And then and Visit London, we won the Olympics and we were were part of that bid campaign and we um, wrote the strategy. So for, three pretty awesome so chances. Big, big, well, big let's games, just yeah. dig into those yeah. because, I mean, Disney, I mean, a lot of people, you know, we've, we've been, many, many been to Disneyland or Disneyland Paris or they bought the product, seen the shows, but a big part is the culture of Disney. I mean, if yeah. you were to sum it up in terms of the organization that kind of, I guess, gave you your start, what, what would be the takeout for you? So the, the great thing about Disney is it, it celebrates at its heart creativity and innovation uh, and actually massively ahead of its time and ahead of the kind of the trends that we're seeing now. It, and, you know, Disney manages to evolve and iterate through its creativity, through the movies, and then it may, manages to translate all of that into um, ways of making money. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think, you know, you, you, you've seen that for many, many years. And it was, you know, Walt Disney right at the beginning was an amazing innovator, an amazing creator. So that was the, the culture. It so, was the, uh, did that give you your start? Did that help you with your own attitude in business, having worked at a place like Disney? Yeah, it was amazing. It was almost like doing an MBA, but in a kind of very creative creative way without the numbers. <laughs> with Mickey Mouse. Um, yeah, with Mickey Mouse, yeah. So, so there you have it. Um, so I think um, what it was good is it's that sense of place, that sense of occasion, that sense of experience, which, of course, is so important in retail. So going into retail after that, I was able to take a lot of that experience and learning and, and, and put that into, mm. into, into use in retail. I mean, a lot of people could never forgive Disneyland for sticking it in Paris and not London. Um, <laughs> did, have we learned to forgive? I think we've learned to forgive, and I think it's great. I mean, I think the you know the, the communication between London and Paris, um, you know, the, the transport links. We wouldn't have probably maybe had them if Disney hadn't been committing to that. So I think. Oh, we so we them. can thank I Disneyland think we can for your stuff. Absolutely, some of that. Yes, absolutely. Excellent. Right, let's move on then. So we from, did win the uh, I hadn't thought about yeah. that. So uh, <laughs> merci. That's, uh, let's, uh, let's move on. Selfridges. Right. Okay. So you. You know, a lot of your reputation as a business leader, I think, sort of was forged through the Selfridges experience. So, so tell us what the job was. And well, the, the job was I was the marketing director. I worked for a guy called Vittorio Radice, who was the CEO, amazing Italian guy. And our job was to turn that business around. So it was we found it in a terrible state, and we had to use uh, everything we could think of to give to, it its mojo to, back. To give it its mojo back. Mm. And, and we were a very tight management team who worked there for five or six years and, and did that. And, and it was very, very successful from a kind of a destination point of view. And you can see the amount of people who are going. But also, of course, it became very commercial as well. So that was uh, that was good. So when you look at the reputation you were trying to <clears throat> sort of build for Selfridges, what, what was the what did you want consumers, the punter, to take out of 
of a trip to Selfridges. So the real thing was to create an, uh, an environment uh, that, that, that felt like there was always something new there. So mm -hmm. our, our kind of um, mantra was like, this is exposing people to the new things. So it was the new brands, the new experiences. We had the first tattoo parlor in London. We had um, amazing um, experiences. We did these great big promotions with uh, the kind of the Bollywood film stars would come. The, the, we did a whole Brazilian theme with Copacabana and the, and the, and the carnival. And really the idea was that there was always something great going on in Selfridges. And of course, if we had the amazing brands, the latest products, so the, the latest the designs. greatest showman. We were the showman. But it was really what Gordon Selfridge did when he founded Selfridges all those years again. That's what he did. He had the first sale. He had the first kind of window displays. And we took that and we translated it into mm. the early 2000s. I mean, I mean obviously, we, I mean, many of us have watched Mr. Selfridge. I mean, you know, <laughs> do, 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 do you think that gives a fair feel? I that, think it's pretty good, actually. Yeah. I was really pleased to, to see it. I think mm. it was it's clearly there's um, a few nuances that aren't maybe exactly true. But I think it was a great it was a fair field and he was a showman I mean the mm. shame of course was that it didn't he did, didn't go well for him at the end but but Selfridges r remains as a, as a great Brings success up to date. do you think do you think it's still got do you think it's still got it I think it's a pretty great um, organization it's very well run very well and it's you know that positioning London remains Michael. and and yeah. you know you look at the department store uh, business generally which is uh, not has not responded to the change and has not innovated and you know a lot of these businesses are going going out of business mm. whereas Selfridges remains buoyed up by the international um, appeal of London and and also by us Londoners who like to go and shop there. So let's move on to London, because yeah. obviously you had the London Brief 2012, the big message out to the market. Tell us a little bit about that. So it was an amazing time, um, as, as we all remember, and 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 the the kind of the, the Olympics was almost the kind of the finale of that fantastic time um, that London the had. The 2012 as, uh, feel as the number you know yeah. the number one city in the world, and it was a great privilege and pleasure to be around the world presenting and promoting. London. So you were doing that that I was pitch. Doing that. Absolutely, yeah. alongside uh, Lord Coe and and Ken Livingstone, so the mayor of London in those days. So we'd go around and we were we were there presenting London as a place to come and invest, to come on holiday, and of course to get involved in the Olympics. So it was a it was an absolutely superb moment mm. in time. That, were you there um, for any of the big? The big moments. I was there. I was. I was. I was there for some of them, but I wasn't actually still with Visit London at during the Olympics. I was more in the lead up of it. The lead up. Yeah. Absolutely. What did it feel like? When we won, I mean, for, for the for the organising. So I mean, teams. it was extraordinary. I was in Trafalgar Square, and the, so there were, um, uh, and and actually, I had to um, go. There was, the, I had to do something with Eurostar, and there was a, a group. I had to open a train after this thing. So I was in the Trafalgar Square. The announcement came, and I've never seen Trafalgar Square animated like it. It came just through, and it was just up. absolutely extraordinary. Mm. And of course, we were pitching against the French, and um, there was a whole the whole of the senior management for Eurostar were in Paris, waiting to smash the bottle, and it was me on my own. Here because so everyone's going to Disneyland yes, exactly. after that. <laughs> so, you know, so it was a fantastic experience. And, you know, for the, I mean, London is such an amazing place and such a great place to sort of have that uh, mu massively international community together and to unite around every single team having a, a mm. home crowd in London, which was something that we could offer. And, and when you compare and contrast, London in 2012 to, to 2019, what, what's the difference in the city, do you think? Well, I think the ingredients are still here. But our, I, I, I fear that um, you know we are not capitalising on all of that amazing success, and we're and it's eking away. So, so. So when you look uh, at the factors, is, is it is it Brexit or is it more more than that? No, I think it is. You know, primarily Brexit. I think primary and and people are just saying I'm fed up with it. I want and a lot of people, a lot of my European friends are moving back to to Paris or or Austria or you know Italy. Um, and businesses, uh, you know, are are finding this very difficult. But so, you, so the London brand is not travelling as well? Without a doubt it is not what it was, without a doubt, which is, a, which is very, very disappointing. And the more that this carries on, I mean, I've just had a friend this morning send me from Amsterdam saying, you know, why don't you guys come and live in Amsterdam? It's fantastic, mm. you know, it's a great place. So all of that, so, so it means that we have to get D going and, you know, Does the mayor get that, do you think? Does, does Sadiq Khan um, get it, understand it, or I would think, powerless to do uh, much about it? I don't know, it? I don't know powerless to do much about it, I, I think is, is more. Um, and it's a real shame, but, you know, we, are, we do have the ingredients, <clears throat> so I remain positive that we can get that back, and we need to get that back because London is such an amazing city. Right, 2017, you published a book, <clears throat> Disrupt. Um, I've read it, 100 Lessons in Business Innovation. Give us the one that viewers might sort of take well, out and use. <clears throat> It's a bit like you're not allowed to have favourites, but the one that I, I do enjoy is the um, is the edible drone, which is uh, so all these innovations are global; they're all from all around the world. But this one actually is from um, 
from a, an English uh, inventor, and, and effectively what he had done is um, invented a drone that would take um, supplies into war-torn um, destinations, so, so places where they need, they need supplies fast. And, not a, and it's very difficult to fly planes over because you get shot down all of that. So there's a drone that goes in and it lands with the supplies, but then you can eat the wings and that's, the rest of it turns brilliant. into a firewood. So, yeah. so what it is, it's doing a lot of things. It's kind of um, you know, completely recyclable, circular, but also um, doing something that's, that's driving positive change. And the one thing I, I kind of missed out is that you know, what we're really trying to do with Springwise is cover innovations that matter, that are going to create that positive change. So rather than just the next tech thing that's going to make money, which we will also cover, but we're really looking at things that are mm. going to make a difference to people's and, lives. And you're optimistic about the role of business as the change maker. I, I, I think we have to be. I think you know, there's not much. No one else is really going to do it. And mm. um, I think you know, we need to help government get there, and we need to work collectively to do it. But I think business, um, you know, has the agility and has the you know the resources in many many ways to to, to get there and to innovate for a for a more positive. And, and if you're one of the businesses future. that is currently being disrupted by one of your you know 100 innovations, yeah. I mean. In terms of, I mean, it's, it's often fine when you're the one doing the disrupting, yeah. but when you're being disrupted, when you're sort of yeah. a traditional industry, what, what, what do they need to do to get with the programme to actually make sure that they are here in more than five years. So I think you know you have to. A first first thing is that we always say is you know be aware of it and and, and look at what's happening around the world. So we look at the Springwise network and we're kind of looking at things that are happening. So that helps people in a non-threatening way understand that they are being disrupted. And the second thing, and I take retail as an example, is you need to then adapt to it. So it, online retail is coming really fast. It's, it's taking away a lot of the business, but it's but actually your stores are still really really important. So what you need to do is change the store experience to some something that is closer maybe to marketing than just sales and create those experiences. One of the reasons Selfridges remains very, very successful. And think about life in a different way and think about how you can connect that digitally rather than just go, oh my goodness, and put your head in the sand and not do something. So, so yeah, please. Well, we're right out of time, but, <laughs> but Selfridges in 100 years, will it be an online store or will we still see the, the Corinthian pillars? Still see the Corinthian pillars, absolutely. Thank you, James. And that's it. That's all we have time for this week. And I have to tell you, if train spotting made the career of Ewan McGregor, guess what? Trend spotting has made the career of my guest, James Bidwell, an innovator with a passion for purpose and an eye for the extraordinary. It's a story of tracking the defining trends of our time and answering the question, what comes next? And if you're looking for more in the way of answers, I'll tell you what, we'll be back for the next in the Capital Conversation. I'll see you then.